We're now recording the second lymphatic system and immunity system lecture. By backtracking a little bit to this review of what we called innate immunity, we find two different kinds of immunity. One is loaded and ready to go at birth. When you come out of your mother, these systems are already present. They don't require any experience with the environment. They don't require any previous um, previous uh, uh, infection. Um, they are part of our built-in resistance to disease and uh, injury. Now, this first system is called innate immunity. Hold on just a second. And innate immunity really consists of two very different strategies. We're going to stop and acknowledge an entire organ system as a part of innate immunity. That's the skin. The integumentary uh, system is very much like a fort with impenetrable walls and protected entrances and exits. And so this first category, we've already dealt with the uh, function of the integumentary system, but we want to list it as our first type of innate immunity. And it's very different from everything that follows. Last time we started, and I'll go quickly through the first few of these, the phagocytes, these are white blood cells that are capable of um, moving like amoeba, amoeboid movement. Now, amoeba move the way they do by cytoplasmic streaming. They explore at random as they move around their environment, and they have chemical detectors on their membrane that allow them to predict, to detect prey and uh, basically capture it. This is called phagocytosis when you're talking about an amoeba. Now, in our body, these white blood cells have that capability of detection and eating. So they do perform endocytosis. They are called phagocytes because they emulate these free living microorganisms. Immune surveillance is the action of natural killer cells which are loaded and ready to go. The wonder, wonderful thing we've discovered about natural killers is they can actually detect an abnormal body cell. An abnormal body cell, such as one that is infected by a bacteria or infected by a virus, destroying the cell, interrupts the infection cycle and curtails the spread. Interferons are chemicals that come out of infected cells. And their effect is on the uninfected cells. They actually prime those uninfected cells. So if they are infected, they destroy themselves. Apoptosis, or programmed cell death, comes from interferons. Again, destroying the cell curtails the spread of the infection. The complement system is a set of proteins, meaning a set of genes. And they will end in destroying a pathogen. You see the complements attacking here and destroying what is drawn as a bacteria. The other secondary effects, though, are just as important. Uh, those bacteria may, in fact, be concealed from these normal phagocytes. But if the complement protein uh, binds them, they uh, the phagocytes can notice them and uh, destroy them. Also, uh, complement-bound material often stimulates the inflammation reaction more completely. We're going to talk today about inflammatory response with its multiple effects, kind of a body-wide reaction. Uh, body-wide because although the injury or the um, infection often has a particular location that begins in one spot, we do have um, we do have the ability to broadcast around the body and recruit to that location some of the uh, body's defensive mechanisms. Fever 
is a resetting of our thermostat and taking advantage of the close uh, adaptation of, um, of, of the bacteria that inhabit our body to the growth conditions in our body. It turns out that out in the general world, <clears throat> bacteria that live in soil or that live in water or on tree bark, you change the temperature a couple of degrees Fahrenheit, that's very little effect on them. But the bacteria growing in our body are used to 98.6, that constant um, temperature and a high temperature that allows for rapid cell growth. If you specialize at that temperature, that means that you can you can actually live without the genes that provide uh, tolerance to temperature variation. Conversely, though, if you take that body temperature and raise it from 98.6 to 101.6, you've raised it enough to really slow down bacterial reproduction. And I shouldn't just say bacteria, I should say pathogens. I'm going to go quickly through these uh, slides that we have already covered. The skin, first line of defense, and that includes the outside covering shown in purple and the inside lining shown in pink. It includes both physical barriers that are based mainly on the different kinds of epithelium and also antimicrobial chemicals. So those chemicals that make a surface like the skin inhospitable to the reproduction of a bacteria that may land on, or those things that are lining the uh, internal linings that either move infection along like mucus production or uh, antimicrobial action from uh, mucus-associated lymphoid tissue or skin-associated lymphoid tissue. The skin we've dealt with in great uh, uh, detail. Here we see the mucus cells on the linings. Any passageway in the body that opens to the outside has these goblet cells that produce mucus to some extent and basically keep the, the, the uh, passageway lubricated. That's an important feature if you're moving something through a passage but also make it have a sticky surface that you can basically clean off. Physical barriers included the presence of lysosomes that make lysozymes, a general attack kind of vesicle, the gastric acid that's present, pH 2 or lower in the stomach, and competitive exclusion from those things that occupy our body but do not do us any harm. And this is one of the things I don't think we emphasize enough that we serve as the habitat, the planet, for a large variety of other species. They may be prokaryotes, they may be fungal, they may be eukaryotic in their cell type, they may be animals. So the parasites like mites, uh, the parasites that actually can reproduce in our body, the diseases like malaria, uh, where an organism is uh, attacking a red blood cell. Um, all of those uh, have to deal with the other things that grow there. And the things that cause disease are often secondary in their success to the wild types. So competitive exclusion is an idea that's kind of behind what we call probiotics. The idea of probiotics is what we're adding bacteria to our gut flora as a way of normalizing the gut flora. Perhaps we've just dealt with uh, treatments of courses of, of antibiotics for specific reasons and our biodiversity of those gut flora is reduced, replacing with um, other species, increasing that diversity is thought to have a positive effect on health. Phagocytosis by the white blood cells we have covered. Uh, the macrophages are what differentiate from monocytes. And they're present in the tissue. They basically clean up any infected area. They live uh, for a matter of months. And they can be energized and activated by conditions in the body. Macrophages also have a kind of a routine job of detecting and removing what we call debris. So when we're making red blood cells all the time 
and turning them over all the time. It's macrophages largely in locations like the spleen or locations uh, like the liver that are detecting these worn out red blood cells and removing them from circulation so that these new red blood cells are taking their place. Neutrophils are by far the most abundant. They're active, they're, they're shorter lived, but they basically have a constant killing power. Now, they're the model child for innate immunity, loaded and ready to go when you're born, and they work on, work on pattern recognition. Every cell in the body, except the gametes that you produce, is an exact genetic copy of that fertilized egg that you started from. Now that includes every body cell, and that includes every white blood cell, such as a neutrophil. So when a neutrophil wanders up to a kidney cell or a stomach cell, it's in the, it's in the urinary bladder, it's in the brain, it's in the muscle. It's actually dealing with a cell that in most cases has a nucleus that is identical to the neutrophil's nucleus. So there's this tremendous ability of self-recognition by neutrophils. It, it, a little kind of uh, sound bite to remember neutrophils, if it's not me, meaning close to an identical twin, my nucleus, I'm going to eat it and I'm going to keep eating until my cytoplasm is full and this basically kills off the neutrophils uh, in a site of infection. Immune surveillance came from another type of killer cell, the natural killer cell, a type of lymphocyte, which can recognize its, its tremendous uh, talent is to recognize a body cell. Here's a body cell. Unlike the neutrophil that would leave this alone because the nucleus is identical, the natural killer will recognize a body cell that has something different about it. In this case, the red dots indicate some kind of binding, uh, making this a potentially harmful cell. The natural killer essentially aligns and produces vesicles with perforin that will basically attack the cell that's infected and destroy it. Now, I want to point out, once a cell is infected, there is a development cycle for the bacteria or for the virus to use that cell to reproduce. If you interrupt that prior to completion, prior to the production of more bacteria, prior to the production of more viruses, then what you basically have is parts. It'd be sort of like the parts of a car lying separately on the garage floor. You're not going to be able to start that car and drive it away. The virus is not going, is not intact. It's not going to be able to infect another cell. And this is something where we're really actively studying natural killers to ensure that we understand everything that they can do. Now, obviously, they don't do everything. And that shows something about this mutation that allowed natural killers to exist. They didn't develop the ability to attack absolutely every antigen. But they do have effectiveness in a wide array, array of things. The real point is this. If, by chance, the natural killer can recognize and attack a certain kind of infection, and that infection leads to a lot of mortality, then the people with the genes for that natural killer are going to survive at a higher rate. The people in subsequent generations are going to be the descendants of those that have the natural killer genes. And as a result, this mechanism is going to be preserved as one of the tools in our toolbox that we call immunity. Interferons, I think we're getting close to where we were last time. The idea with interferon, it's chemical, it's a protein. That protein is going to prepare uninfected cells in the vicinity of an infected cell. So a cell has already been infected, you can see that here. Here's the virus coming in. The presence of single-stranded DNA and the synthesis of this double-stranded DNA to begin working on new virus particles is a difference in this cell. And this nucleus of the infected cell produces interferon. Now, this cell is doomed when it produces the parts, and you can see here the nucleic acid and the protein coat 
assembled into active virus particles. And this has produced three, six, seven intact virus particles. When this breaks, it's going to release new viruses that are infected. So let's jump back over here. What happened to the interferon that this original cell produced? It basically invades cells in the immediate area around the infected cell, basically by diffusion, and it activates a gene for IAVP protein. Now the IAVP then is in some dozens, perhaps 200s of cells, around the original infected cell. And it prepares them in case of infection. If one of these seven viruses attacks a interferon primed cell, then it induces a genetic reaction by this cell that bursts the membrane. Once again, destroy this infected cell in this stage. So this, the, there may be RNA there, there may be some bare protein coats, but it's not assembled. And what you have is parts lying on the floor. So you are circumventing the completion of the virus cycle to produce infectious particles. And because you don't have them assembled, the infection and its spread is contained. This is called apoptosis, when something programs a body cell to self-destruct. And the idea of self-destruction is what? If, if this infection by the virus produces seven virus particles, that's a potential seven cells that will be infected. And that, and only seven. So that means that if all of them are primed by interferon and burst before the virus particle is uh, active, then that particular infection is over. Interferon has different uh, identities, different proteins, uh, and different specialties. Notice that um, interferon alpha is produced by virus infect, uh, in infected cells. You can see them here. But the presence of these, they not only prime a cell, but they stimulate natural killer cells to attack. And so a secondary mechanism is brought into play. This is called activation whenever there's a secondary effect that, attack, uh, that attracts and activates other uh, elements of the immune system. Beta is for fibroblasts. It basically slows inflammation in a damaged area. And gamma is secreted by T cells and natural killers. And it's interesting that those T cells, cell mediated immunity, um, stimulates the activity by my macrophages. So there is a sort of a cross category identification and activation that we're, we're discovering where one system uh, uh, activates another. So that brings us to where we stopped last time the complement system. And for complements, Complement is to antibody response. So it's not an antibody itself, but it's stimulating other elements of this system. Um, these proteins that are called complements are produced by cells and circulate in the body fluids. And when they are activated, it leads to a sequence that destroys foreign material. Now that may be a toxin, that may be a bacteria, maybe a virus. So there we've covered something like a simple chemical, a toxin, something like a complex chemical, a virus, something like a living cell, a bacteria, or a fungus, a fungi cell. There are antifungal reactions that are moderated. And then finally, eukaryotic cells themselves. It's going to be a cascade reaction and like most um, metabolic reactions, what do we notice about them is they're not simple. They'll often involve multiple steps of gene expression. And those multiple steps lead to an eventual recognition by another cell like a macrophage. Let's try to make some sense out of this because uh, uh, another feature of this, look at this, three different pathways 
that are activated by different stimuli, antigen antibody complexes is what was first detected. But the lectin involves man and binding lectins to the cell surface, a particular uh, protein signal. And finally, the alternate pathway is uh, stimulated by a member of this complex, 3B itself, and uh, leading to an enhancement of this, bringing in of more complements. Now, the only purpose of this center part of the named proteins that we've detected in these different pathways, they can be stimulated by any or all three of these stimuli. And protein C3 begins by breaking in two. Notice that C3A by itself and in concert with 5A, which is produced later, stimulates inflammation. Now that's with all of the uh, effects of inflammation. That in involves increased diameter of the blood vessels in the region, so vasodilation, flooding the area, increasing the blood pressure, increasing the heat, increasing the flow of white blood cells, a reddening uh, of the surface, if it's a surface injury, all are stimulated by the complements 3A and 5A. This other half, 3B, has a direct uh, effect. So this fragment of C3 can attach to a wide variety of microbial cells. Once attached, they have an interesting feature, and that is they attract the binding or the attention. Here's a receptor on the surface of the white blood cell, and as you can see, the binding of 3B on the surface of the bacteria has caused a binding to the receptor on the white blood cell. So this is called opsonization. So this is sort of like, as 3B is sort of like a scout in the infantry. The scout goes out and identifies targets. In some cases, if they carry a laser painter, they're shooting that laser to the surface of the target. And so whether it's a communication about coordinates of a target or it's the direct marking of the target, um, it brings attention from the real destructive units like the infantry or like the artillery or like air support and basically says, here it is, I'm going to attack it needed. Now, 3B also stimulates the production of a second complement, 5, which splits to 5A and 5B, and 5A, as we said, contributes to inflammation. 5B stimulates the production of uh, other um, complement proteins. So look at the genes involved. C6, C7, C8, C9. Now together, those complements are a membrane attacking complex and they attack foreign cells. Here's the double uh, layer, the bilayer of the phospholipid membrane. And the presence of this color, notice C6 is the most common, but you also need eight, seven, and nine in order to insert in this foreign cell and produce a hole in the membrane. This produces lysis or the destruction of the foreign cell. So in, in uh, contrast to previous mechanisms where we were destroying our own abnormal cells, this is actually destroying the pathogen. The classical pathway is shown here and it's going to be just a reiteration of, um, of what we've seen before, the sort of arms race that protein chemistry is producing. The pathogens arrive with a certain number of weapons that are in protein form called antigens, and their life cycle inside the human body produces harm. The body responds with proteins which can react with those antigens, identify the pathogen, and in some way suppress or uh, eliminate its reproduction. So. What, are we, what we're seeing here is, here are the antibodies uh, attaching to the bacterial cell wall. In this case, these antibodies attract C1 complement, 
activating C2 to C3B, and we see here the attachment of C3B. The alternative pathway, uh, the presence of these factors um, as a defense against bacteria, some parasites and virus infect itself, we have a C3 pathway that's induced. This is an alternative pathway uh, with new chemical signals, propyrdine, uh, factor B and factor D involved in the control of bacteria in this case. And finally, forming a cell pore. So a membrane attack complex, as we've seen before, and C5 and 9 are not colored here, but they're the same ones we discussed. Um, and they lead to multiple pores. A bacteria can't stand a perforation in its membrane, and that cell lysis kills it. They also enhanced phagocytosis, meaning uh, white blood cells notice these complement labeled uh, pathogens. They also produce the re release of histamine. Let me say this, we just went through a fairly complex pathway with C3B, C, uh, pro Proparin and other factors interacting. I'm less interested in you memorizing the details of that but more interested in you seeing that what a complement system is, is a set of proteins that have evolved at this point specifically to attack those things which produce death in humans. And the connection is always one of a genetic cellular system. If you have the gene to produce these proteins, then you suffer from you know, your life is extended by resistance to a specific group of lethal disease-causing vectors. And so the genes that, uh, that cause that are, um, are uh, preserved and proliferate uh, in the body. That's called natural selection. Uh, phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is one we expect we want to review that in microorganisms, we study them in general biology, phagocytosis, or cell eating, is a type of heterotrophic nutrition. Heterotrophic means other feeding. Nutrition means you're getting the carbon fragments that you need to provide the material to build your own cell, maintain it, and to break down to produce the ATP to drive those reactions of your metabolism. Now those free living microorganisms are eating for nutrition. Our body phagocytes are nourished by the nutrients that are in our blood. They don't eat for nutrition. However, they do attack foreign cells uh, foreign material and consume it in in reacting to it they change its nature so killing a bacterium as is shown here is adequate for controlling that bacteria but first you have to recognize it and catch it that's what these complement labels and the receptors on the white blood cell membrane are all about once inside, this vesicle is called a phagosome. It's resulted from a cell-eating process that has enclosed the pathogen. And things like lysosomes or other lytic enzymes are introduced, which kills and dissociates the bacteria. Now, some things like amino acids that are, were in the bacteria or nucleic acids uh, can be reclaimed, but it's interesting that that concept, it sounds so beautiful, that we could be able to capture and recycle everything. But in, in the general timing of the life of this cell, it may be a more effective phagocyte if it simply throws these non-living and non-infectious materials away and continues its job. So phagocytosis is basically just a mechanism that was in free living cells. That mechanism was preserved by um, 
natural selection because of its effect on uh, increasing our longevity, our survival, and increasing our reproduction. Finally, we've seen any number of mentions of this process, a general bodily process that will attend injury any part of the uh, body. This is often seen as some kind of a fall, which shows here a scrape of the knee. And it, it's important to realize that it's not just where you look and see bleeding or bruising, where inflammation may be um, at, at work. In fact, with aging, as our elastic tissues decline, as our cartilage surfaces on our joints um, get thin, as our muscles and connective tissue lose their flexibility, all of these things contribute to, uh, to noticeable changes on the outside, a thinning of the skin, a loss of flexibility, a loss of muscular power as we age. And accompanying that is often pain in joints. Accompanying that is distress in the respiratory system and so forth. So these are instances where inflammation is not related to a, a chronic condition, something that is episodic like this injury, but to an acute condition, something that is ongoing. And so joint swelling is something that is a problem in older people. The purpose of inflammation is to contain the site of damage, minimize the damage, but also identify it to the body. The chemicals in that location identify here is where we're hurt. The pain signals from our nervous system are the ones that cause us to notice and react to the injury and direct our um, repair to those uh, particular locations. So we're going to localize that response and contain it, and we're going to repair it, restore tissue function, in this case an injury. We're going to um, also, in addition to the injury itself, we're changing the conditions right at that location. So we've gone from a sealed, impermeable integument to one that's now open. It's exposed to the atmospheric air. It's exposed to drying. Dirt in the form of particles, sand, dust, and microorganisms which cover everything have been introduced. And the tissue is damaged and compromised. We've killed a certain number of cells. So how does the body react? The typical signs we see result from vasodilation. That produces the redness from the flooding of, of blood into that region and its approach to the very uh, bottom part of the epidermis. Swelling from that increased blood flow. Heat from the increased blood flow. The swelling stretches stretch receptors and produces the pain in the surface neurons and their detectors. And also, uh, the specialized cells called mast cells and other elements of the immune system release what I'll call damaged chemicals. It is only under these changed conditions that the mast cells will release things like histamine, heparin, or prostaglandins that identify, chemically identify, this is the center of the target. If you think of an archery target with that red center and the concentric circles, if you're producing the damaged chemicals at the center, they're diffusing out through the ambient surrounding tissues, producing a globe of effect. Well, if they reach a lymph vessel and there are immune cells, phagocytes in that vessel, sort of like police on patrol, and all of a sudden they start getting uh, signals from the presence of one of these damaged chemicals binding with receptors on their membrane. Then they start to form pseudopodia faster. They actually start to move and basically cast around with random motion. If you move toward the injury, 
and that's going to increase the rate of these firing. Sort of like, I think of a Geiger counter. You're waving a Geiger counter over plain rock, and it's going tick, 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 tick. You move it over to a sample pitch blend, the raw form of uranium. It's going to go from tick, 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 to grrr. And that's what's happening as the white blood cells move around. As they move around, the faster rate of binding on the membrane allow them to actually move up that concentration gradient of things like histamine. When they get to the maximum concentration, they are at the site of, uh, of injury or of uh, infection. So here we see the um, a standard injury where uh, a uh, lesion in the skin is introducing bacteria and also damaging blood vessels. The chemical change in this interstitial fluid stimulates mast cells. Histamine and heparin are released and this becomes then the center of the injury gradient. This is where the damaged chemicals, histamine and heparin, are most Active. Now, it's a good connection here, by the way, inflammation in this case is to an actual injury, the actual introduction of bacteria. So something needs to be done to minimize and localize that effect. But I know you grew up with antihistamines. Histamines in pollen, or pollen uh, breathing, causes histamine release, and that produces the inflammation reaction in most of our allergens allergies. It will produce more mucus production, swelling of membranes, a clogging of airways, uh, increase in mucus production, increasing sneezing and coughing. Now that's a react something that's not actually going to harm us. It's just uh, nudging that immune system and uh, that's a problem. But in general mass cell activation is for a very positive purpose. Uh, you see here the vasomotion, in this case vasodilation, flooding, stretching the walls of these capillaries, basically increasing the blood flow. Uh, that makes this capillary more permeable, delivering more oxygen, delivering more nutrient, providing for uh, diapedesis of things like macrophages jumping out of this cardiovascular system as they detect a histamine. The clot formation is temporarily blocking the blood loss, but here you have this broken and contaminated region that has to be uh, repaired and also sterilized. The inside the body is not the place for bacterial cultures. Phagocytes are attracted. Phagocytes release a sec another chemical, cytokines, which have a big effect against specific defense and the attack and removal of debris. So what has happened when you you know pierced the skin, you've destroyed certain living cells. You've um, uh, cut the stratum basale layer. Um, all of those produce body cell debris in addition to the debris that's introduced by invading organisms. So what we're going to do at the base of this clot is we're going to basically start with fibroblasts and make collagen fibers and elastic fibers to repair, basically sort of like the, the um, uh, eyes that you use on your boots to uh, uh, bind your boots through the shoelace. Uh, we're basically going to hook the new collagen to collagen fibers that are out here in intact tissue on both sides and draw that wound together. You can see this happening from the base up as we see both fibroblasts and uh, in this region and also macrophages working in this region uh, to remove the remnants of the debris of the injury. We see the differential effect here as these blood vessels swell and that red area spreads out. We can see that. Um, 
we can also see a region where histamine release, other damaged chemicals, uh, which uh, identifies this chemically as the region of, of repair. Here is a phagocyte moving through the bloodstream, a capillary in that region, and detecting histamine heparin, basically becoming sticky and sticking to the blood vessel. The blood vessel is sticky in return. And literally crawling out of the capillary and uh, basically in, that, in this way, chemically, we are recruiting phagocytes uh, to the site of injury. Um, the process of crawling out of the bloodstream by a white blood cell is called diapedesis. It's a particular location. You gotta wonder, you know, how is it you have an injury like this tack piercing your skin? And within a matter of, uh, of minutes to hours, you have a huge population of white blood cells at work patrolling this area to remove not only debris, but invading pathogens. Diapedesis explains that process. The inflammation tends to aggregate the repair. I really like this lower picture because it kind of shows the location of the uh, injury. It is forming a kind of a peak. It is forming a head. And this is true of infections that they basically have a contained region which literally thins around the connect co collection of these dead cells. Now for a surface injury like this, you can definitely see where the pointer is right now, defines the sort of the limit of diffusion. So if histamine, mast cells started right here, releasing histamine and heparin, it's diffusing out right around to this area. This is where the limit of that swelling and uh, uh, vasodilation stops. See how the skin out here is normal colored. You can also see the presence of these white blood cells, neutrophils first and most active of all, eating themselves to death, literally, until uh, as, as these dead cells accumulate, because these are white blood cells, pus has a kind of a white or yellowish color, and it basically forms and crowns and basically this is a mechanism that allows for the release of this dead material uh, basically uh, uh, prior to final completion of healing. This is called a boil or an abscess and draining these at a certain point uh, can have a speeding effect of, of uh, uh, in healing. I would also mention that there are instances of internal or septic infections. Septic infection is sort of deeper in and within the sterile, but past the sterility barrier of the skin. And uh, it can be an infection that can lodge in a particular place and cause wide ranging effects. Two years ago, we almost lost my brother-in-law. Uh, he had, uh, we still do not know how it got there, but here in, in, in the muscle of his left arm, he had a strep infection, which was septic and was not responding to systemic antibiotics. It had to be removed surgically along with the tissue it had lodged in. Um, there are, in some cases, examples of septic infections. Uh, where the infection actually will move, uh, destroying tissue along its path until it reaches the skin and forms from an internal place out to a, a crowning or uh, release place. That's called a perforating abscess. But uh, in the uh, case of my brother-in-law, he was lodged there and he almost, he was in intensive care five days before they located and uh, operated. And the, uh, some of the uh, uh, damage from that extended septic infection was permanent. Uh, and we noticed it in the uh, extended healing period. He uh, is uh, slightly younger than I am, but uh, 
never did recover his full vitality. He's still doing that. Um, and it was uh, on the verge of killing him by the time it was diagnosed correctly. Um, acute inflammation is, is basically repair, healing, injury. Mostly neutrophils can take care of that job. It often involves a surface. But if this becomes a ongoing condition of a body part, we call that chronic, and um, long-term presence of macrophages uh, is, is uh, something we would expect to see. So monocytes will produce macrophages in large numbers, and cells that are called giant cells indicate a kind of infection. Granulomas will be present in this long-term uh, chronic condition. Uh, we are looking at chronic inflammation, um, and uh, we are using the suppression of immunity as a tool in countering the effects of aging. Things like pain, loss of mobility, and so forth uh, in periods that we would consider geriatric decline. Fever is our final innate mechanism, and it takes advantage of the growth cycle of a bacteria or a pathogen. The idea is this, free living bacteria out there, they may just go inactive or have a spore form in order to endure uh, unfavorable seasons like winter. But a free living bacteria in the environment is in, in Missouri outside our door is tolerating uh, what in the last year uh, temperatures between 105 Fahrenheit and uh, let's say zero to 10 below Fahrenheit. So they basically are adaptable either by being active and inactive or simply by tolerating uh, the condition, a wide range of temperature conditions. But what about those things that grow very well in our body? Our body's 98.6 with minor variations. And so they adapt to that uh, temperature. They don't live that well outside the body because they are narrowly adapted. So what happens when a bacteria of that type invades our body? Well, it turns out chemicals called pyrogens are released. It's detected by the hypothalamus and it changes our thermostat essentially. The set point is increased from 98.6 uh, to an, uh, a, a uh, temperature that is slightly higher, a few degrees is enough to significantly cut down the rate of cell division, especially of these bacteria. So moving them off their optimal rate of cell division, uh, a couple of degrees may move them from 100% rate uh, to uh, something like 15 or 20%. It's slowing the bacteria down. At the same time, it slows down the pathogen. It speeds up our body, bodily defenses. Our immune responses happen quicker. White blood cells are released in greater number from bone marrow and become more active in the body. So this idea of fever is a general response and it must be effective because all of us experience it uh, uh, with the frequency of our infections. So here is our first kind of summary slide for innate immunity. What we want to remember, one unique thing up here, the skin, keep it out. Below, a number of cellular and chemical effects that range from other eating cells to self-destroying cells, self-destroying cells, basically attack cells, attack proteins, and finally a general response of inflammation and fever uh, that affect the ability of, of pathogens to grow in our body. So this innate immunity, we remember, we get it with our fertilized egg. The genetic elements that arrive from our mother and our father and combine in our fertilized egg is what sets up our innate immunity. 
I kind of want to point out, although we all have these to some extent, there's going to be genetic variability for each one. So when we look at our natural killers, they're not genetically identical to the natural killers of other people. In some cases, their natural killers may be more effective than ours. So we expect genetic variation within any one of these mechanisms, and that kind of accounts for the difference in susceptibility that we experience and the difference in sensitivity that we experience to the proteins that we call antigens. So, what I'd like to do, since we have um, gone about an hour, is end the recording.